Dear colleagues, welcome to the fourth annual Encore Earth Colloquium presented by the Encore Earth Network and our esteemed partners at the American Society for Radiation Oncology, the European Society of Surgical Oncology, the European Society of Gynecological Oncology, MASC, the International Association of Supportive Care in Cancer, SIOG, the International Society of Geriatric Oncology, and the Oncolor Consortium, which is made up of 12 medical oncology societies from low and middle income countries. Today, we bring you the top of 2023 in gynecological oncology in the ESCO session and wrapping up with a presentation in geriatric oncology brought to us by SIOG. Our presenters are Dr. Nicole Consin, president of ESCO with a new EC FIGO staging system, Dr. Nicolo Bizarre, Updates on surgical trials in gynecological oncology. Dr. Isabel Raikukoft, systemic therapy for uterine LMS. Dr. Viola Heinzelman Schwartz, is there a role of predictive biomarkers for ET in gyne malignancies? And finishing off with Ms. Ika Tooth with the Olivia Digital Patient Pathway. We end up with Dr. Laura DeCoster of SIOG giving us a wrap up of geriatric oncology. We do hope that you enjoy this complete day of gynecological oncology and geriatric oncology. So now, without further delay, President of ESCO, Dr. Nicole Consin. Dear colleagues, my name is Nicole Consin, gynecologist oncologist at the Medical University of Vienna, and it is my pleasure to talk to today about the new FIGO staging system for endometrial carcinoma patients in the era of molecular classification. These are my disclosures. The Cancer Genome Atlas has uh, completely changed our perception of endometrial carcinoma when published in 2013. They have identified four molecular subtypes that are strongly prognostic for our patients. These four molecular subtypes can be quite easily determined in clinical practice uh, by the detection of surrogate markers of these molecular subtypes. Immunohistochemistry can be done to determine the mismatch repair deficiency status and also the P53 status. For poll E analysis, sequencing is needed. With these three analyses, the full four molecular subtypes can be determined. Multiple studies performed by different uh, groups all over the world have confirmed the strong prognostic significance of molecular subgroups in all diverse patients' cohorts, low-grade, high-grade, high-risk uh, tumors, endometroid, uh, endometrial carcinomas. Uh, all studies showed the same, the strong prognostic value. And this has also prompted three European societies, the ESCO, the ESTRO, the ESB, to actually integrate molecular classification into the risk group stratification of our patients into, importantly, the prognostic risk group stratification. These are proven prognostic markers. Uh, one year after the publication of the ESCO-ESTRO-ESP guidelines, also the ESMO, the fourth uh, major European society, has published guidelines and used and integrated molecular profile into their prognostic risk group stratification. And all four European societies, the gynae oncologist, the radiation oncologist, the pathologist, and the medical oncologist, all four societies recommend in their guidelines uh, to do the molecular classification in all endometrial carcinoma uh, patients. Recently, we have published the FICO staging system for endometrial uh, cancer. Uh, the major uh, challenges of this endeavor were that we really needed to implement the evidence of the past 14 years. The last uh, FICO staging was published 2009, so tremendous uh, new evidence in the literature uh, also led to the 
name Cinderella disease for endometrial cancer. Also, the staging system is traditionally an anatomical, pathological staging system based on anatomical spread. And now we integrated two of these important parameters, tumor biology markers, including molecular classification in an optional way. What are the opportunities of the new staging system? Uh, we integrate the current level of evidence in it, and thus it uh, has um, a higher prognostic precision compared to the 2009 staging system. This higher prognostic precision has by now been validated in five published uh, validation studies and also the new FIGO staging system. One of the big advancements is that it identifies treatment uh, relevant subgroups. What are the key changes? You see a lot of changes here. The first uh, Three, four are actually related to the integrated tumor biology markers, histological subtypes and grading, substantial LVSI, molecular classification is optionally integrated if accessible only. Uh, also, the, the uh, metastasis to the ovary are now discriminated to the more favorable group from other metastatic spread to the ovaries, but also the new FICO staging includes new uh, differentiations of anatomical spread. For example, we discriminate now peritoneal carcinomatosis pelvic and extra pelvic from um, uh, parenchymal distant metastasis. Also, uh, the lymph node involvement has been refined. Uh, this talk will focus on the integration, the optional integration of molecular classification into the <clears throat> FICO staging system. So the new st FICO staging system actually gives two options. So one option when molecular classification is not accessible, the tests are not available, then the FICO staging is purely based on surgical, anatomical, and histological findings. So only a surgeon and a pathologist is needed, such as in the old FICO staging system, to actually do the, the uh, classification into different FICO stages. But there is also so optional uh, for if you have access to molecular testing, then there is an option to integrate the knowledge from molecular subtypes into the classical um, uh, FIGO staging system with the advantage to further increase the prognostic system of the staging. Uh, I will show you now some important literature uh, that uh, supports uh, the integration of molecular markers into FICO staging system. This is a very nice study by the uh, based on the Danish database. It importantly only includes high grade, high grade only endometrial cancer stages one to three. And in this study, the role of molecular subgroups was evaluated in patients that are fully lymph node staged and also in patients that did not receive adjuvant treatment. So high-grade endometrial carcinoma only. And here you see the patients who underwent lymph um, node staging. So this is fully staged patients. In the, and in the multivariate analysis, you see that the molecular subgroups remain a strong prognostic factor in the multivariate analysis analysis for recurrence, overall survival, and disease-specific uh, disease survival independent of stage. And moreover, in the multivariate analysis, the tumor stage loses its prognostic significance in the presence of molecular markers, while the molecular markers remain significant. So you see that these are very strong prognostic markers and that anatomical spread in specific situations becomes irrelevant for the prognosis of the patients in the presence of molecular subtypes. 
Uh, this is the stage one patients only in this study that underwent lymphadenectomy, so true stage one patients, no occult unknown lymph node metastasis. And you see that also in this stage one patients, molecular classification is strongly prognostic and that the P53 abnormal are particularly bad uh, related to tumor biology in true stage one disease. Uh, this is the analysis in patients uh, that did not undergo adjuvant treatment, so pure surgical treatment, no adjuvant uh, treatment. And uh, you can see here that also in untreated patients, and this is high-grade only endometrial carcinoma, molecular subtype is strongly prognostic and pol E mutations, if they are present, these patients have an excellent prognosis without treatment. They hardly uh, relapse at all. So this had led uh, the FIGO committee to include two specific situations where the molecular profile really changes the FIGO stage. And we talk about early stage disease only, stage one and stage two. So uterus confined disease. If there is a pole E mutation present in a uterus confined disease, these patients will have excellent prognosis even without treatment. So this uh, demonstrates a new FIGO stage called stage 1A M for molecular polymute if the poly mutation is present. If there is a P53 abnormal um, uh, abnormality present in stage 1, 2 disease, uterus confined disease, these cases are classified as stage 2CM for molecular classification P53 abnormal, as these cases have a particularly bad prognosis in early stage disease. So this is the two specific situations, very easy to remember, uterus confined, ISO with a polymute, excellent prognosis, or a P53 abnormality when myometrial invasion is present um, as the worst case, a worst prognosis category among the early stage diseases. In all other situations, the new FIGO classification for endometrial cancer uh, recommends to record the molecular subtype. So to simply record the information by adding an M and adding the molecular classification to the FIGO stage. <clears throat> this new FIGO staging system has, as said, already been validated by five published validation studies. I want to uh, show you one of the first ones that were published in the European uh, Journal of Cancer last year. This was a study done by three ESCO accredited centers, the Gemelli Clinic in Rome the, and the Universities of Innsbruck and Vienna <clears throat> in Austria. So what did we do? You see here around 500 early stage endometrial carcinoma <clears throat> patients, and we analyzed in um, a retrospective study, we analyzed the stage shift between 2009 and 2022, FICO classification by re uh, staging the patients according to the new FIGO staging system. And you can see here that a, a strong stage shift occurred in these early stage cases uh, in about uh, one a quarter of our patients. <clears throat> and you can see that the uh, up shifts we are mainly related to the presence of P53 abnormalities, but also uh, to the presence of aggressive histological subtypes. And the downstaging to better prognosis was mainly due to uh, pole E mutations. What I want to point out is uh, that you, if you add uh, the two molecular subtypes, you will identify patients with 
particularly excellent prognosis to poly mutated in early stage disease and patients with particularly bad prognosis, which is the P53, abnormal in the early stage disease. And I also want to emphasize that if you look at the prognosis, the old FIGO staging was able to discriminate five-year progression-free survival ranges from around 90% to around 70%. With the new FIGO staging system, you have patients with 100% five-year PFS, and in the worst case, with 55% five-year PFS. So you see the nice FICO, the, the new FICO staging nicely splits off fates um, uh, the prognosis among the patients and you discriminate uh, patient subpopulations with very distinct uh, prognosis. This is another way of depiction uh, in the Kaplan-Meier curves, and you can nicely he see here again polymute, the best prognosis among the early stage P53, normal, the worst prognosis among the early stage disease, and then followed by the uh, FICO stage <clears throat> 3 and 4. We performed multiple statistical tests and they all showed the same, uh, namely the higher um, the, the, the superiority of the new FICO staging system compared to the old one in the prediction of PFS and OS. More validation studies have been published. Uh, this is another nice study that also showed that by the addition of molecular uh, subtypes, uh, you will improve the prognostic prediction uh, of your staging system. Besides the higher uh, prognostic precision of the new staging system, a very important point is also that uh, you will identify treatment-relevant subgroups by the new FIGO staging system. So let's start uh, with the subgroup uh, MMRD, so mismatch repair deficient. This is around 20 to 30% of endometrial carcinoma. They have an intermediate prognosis group and they are hypermutated. We are uh, living in very exciting times. We have seen last year the presentation of the first four randomized phase three trials. So we now have level one evidence for mismatch repair deficiency status to be a, a predictive, not only prognostic, but also predictive marker for the response to immune therapy, to IOs, to checkpoint inhibitors in advanced and recurrent endometrial cancer. This is the RUBY trial showed that the addition of IO uh, in the mismatch repair deficient population, particularly in this population, uh, significantly improves uh, PFS and also OS. The same was uh, shown in the NRGGY18 study, uh, the same in the ATTEND study for the mismatch repair deficient population and also in the DUO-O study. What's about the uh, pole E subtype? Pole E make up 5 to 10% of endometrial carcinoma patients. They have an excellent prognosis and they are ultra mutated. Already since three years in Europe, uh, we have in our triple European guidelines that poll E mutated cases in early stage disease, uterus confined disease, are classified as low risk patients. They do excellent even without any treatment. As, as you have seen in the one study, there are more data on this. And uh, thus, we categorize them as low risk and do not recommend adjuvant treatment in these patients. So this is the adjuvant setting. What's about advanced stages and recurrent disease? As they have such an excellent prognosis, polymutated endometrial carcinoma, you mainly find them in early stages, but uh, rare cases are also seen in advanced stages and recurrent disease. This is the RUBY trial, the only randomized phase three trial where we currently have the molecular subgroup analysis available. You see that only five of such patients with polymutations have been included into RUBY trial. 
So we cannot say anything um, about this here, but we have to remember these are ultra mutated patients. So of course we would expect a response to immune therapy in these patients. And I hope the approvals will come uh, also for this patient population. There are case reports in the literature that show that chemotherapy resistant whole E mutated cases with advanced and recurrent disease uh, responded uh, very well on immune therapy. What's about the NSMP subgroup? The NSMP subgroup is the big majority of endometrial carcinomas, 35 to 50% of cases. It is a very heterogeneous group, histologically, molecularly, and clinically intermediate prognosis group. Uh, we have learned from this nice uh, uh, data from the PORTEC trial, high-risk patients, that these patients can be categorized in estrogen receptor positive cases. Uh, this is about 90% of these cases, and we should not forget hormonal treatment in these patients. And around 10% are estrogen receptor negative. And moreover, and importantly, the presence of the estrogen receptor is highly and strongly prognostic. So NSMP patients with estrogen receptor positivity have a very good prognosis compared to the estrogen receptor negative patients with a bad prognosis. There are promising treatment approaches in the NSMP uh, population, particularly, namely P53 wild type potentiating agents, to name here the uh, Selinexor. This is an oral nuclear export uh, inhibitor. This drug, so it keeps the pro-apoptotic P53 wild type protein in the nucleus of, of the cell, similar um, but different uh, drugs, similar mechanism, also P53 wild type potentiating agent, the naftemadlin. This is an inhibitor of MDM2, which is a key reg negative regulator of P53. So also with this drug, you keep the pro-apoptotic wild type P53 uh, protein in the nucleus. We've seen very nice data on the Selexinor uh, drug in the Siendo trial. This was a randomized trial in advanced and recurrent endometrial carcinoma patients that have been treated with platinum-based chemotherapy and responded to this, and then were randomized into maintenance treatment with Selexinor or placebo. And we have seen the data that in the P53 wild type population, uh, this drug in the maintenance treatment led to a significant improvement in PFS from 5.2 months to uh, 27.4 months. Uh, and this was not seen in the P53 abnormal population. If we have a closer look into the wild type population, what is the wild type population that is all that is not P53 abnormal? So you can further stratify it into the NSMP and the MMRD um, poll E mute cases. We've seen it in Ruby are rarely. Uh, seen in the advanced stage, so probably also here a couple of single patients included, but you see this uh, drug had an effect in both uh, P53 wild type populations. Of course, in the MMRD, uh, you have seen the data of the randomized trials. We know it's a predictive factor level one for excellent IO treatment um, effect. So I think these uh, P53 potentiating drugs are particularly interesting uh, approaches in the future for the NSMP uh, population. The last molecular subtype, the P53, abnormal, why it is important to, to record all these molecular subtypes in our FICO staging uh, system. Uh, they have particularly bad prognosis, make up 10 to 20 percent of our patients. And in Europe already since three years in our guidelines, um, uh, 
abnormal cases of endometrial carcinoma with myometrial invasion are automatically classified as high risk. They have a very bad prognosis and they should be treated like high risk patients with an emphasis on platinum based uh, chemotherapy. Why platinum-based chemotherapy? We know the post hoc exploratory analysis of the randomized phase three uh, high risk uh, population in the POTEX3 trial. And we see here that the addition of chemotherapy to external beam radiotherapy led to a significant uh, survival benefit in the subgroup of the P53 abnormal patients particularly. Also in this P53 abnormal uh, patient population, there are new promising drug approaches. We know, for example, from this study here that P53 abnormal cases of endometrial carcinoma harbor HER2 amplification in around 20% of cases among various histological subtypes. And we have seen nice data last year on the trastuzumab deruxtecan, an antibody drug conjugate targeting uh, her too, and we see that uh, in the uh, her two expressing uh, population, particularly in the high expression population three plus by immunohistochemistry, we've seen response rates of uh, up to eighty four percent in endometrial carcinoma patients with pretreated chemotherapy patients. These are impressive data. We just to conclude, we are currently updating our triple European guidelines and will integrate the new evidence uh, published in the past three years and also refer to the new uh, 2023 FIGO staging system in order to give guidance on how uh, to use clinically use uh, the new uh, FIGO staging system. So key takeaway messages, the new FIGO staging system critically integrates tumor biology. This is a true paradigm uh, shift. So uh, the perception of a staging system uh, goes away from a pure anatomical staging uh, system on clinical spread to an integrated staging system that also respects the strong, very strong prognostic value of tumor biology, um, including also molecular markers if known and acceptable, uh, accessible in an optional way. Uh, the new FIGO staging system has been shown to have a higher prognostic precision in currently published five validation studies. It identifies treatment relevant uh, subgroup. I want to really stress this molecular characterization is encouraged in the new FIGO staging system, but not mandatory. It is integrated in an optional way if there is access to molecular testing. We have defined two specific molecularly defined FIGO stages in very distinct uh, situations that are easy to remember. Early stage disease either with poly mutation or with P53 abnormality with myometrial invasion. And I think it is a very important step forward to integrate uh, molecular classification into international guidelines and also into the FIGO staging system because this will um, elevate. Uh, this approach and will facilitate global access uh, to molecular testing for the benefits of our patients. It gives arguments towards stakeholders to, to uh, provide access and to take over the costs of molecular testing for our patients. And with this, I want to end my presentation. I warmly invite you to the annual Congress of ESCO taking place in March, very soon in the beautiful city of Barcelona. And I very much thank you for your attention. <laughs> Dear Onco Alert friends and colleagues, 
it is a huge honor for me to be here at the 2023 Onco Alert Colloquium. A big thank you to Gil Morgan for this opportunity and thank you for participating in this colloquium. My task is to uh, provide an update on the surgical trials in gynecologic oncology. Therefore, I have divided this short talk in different categories according to each site of disease to show you the updates from the surgical point of view. Starting with cervical cancer, the surgical trial updates are represented by the presentation of the data from the SHAPE trial and the results from the Centix trial, the uh, sub-analysis regarding the lymphedema. The SHAPE trial is an international randomized phase 3 trial comparing radical hysterectomy plus lymph node dissection versus simple hysterectomy and pelvic node dissection in patients with low-risk early-stage cervical cancer. The principal investigator is uh, Professor Mary Plant from Canada, and uh, these results were presented for the first time at ASCO Annual Meeting 2023. Here you have a, a picture from two specimens of what we are talking about. On the left side of the screen you have a specimen from a radical hysterectomy, on the right side a specimen from a simple hysterectomy. The rationale of this trial is represented by the fact that a high proportion of uh, patients with cervical cancer uh, present in young age and with a low risk category. Long-term surgical side effects uh, are a um, consequence of radical hysterectomy, but there is a very low risk of parameter invasion in the low-risk group. Therefore, the hypothesis of this trial is about surgical de-escalation, where less radical surgery, simple hysterectomy, is not associated with uh, worse oncologic outcome, but could be associated with less surgical morbidity and improved quality of life. Here you can see the trial schema and the inclusion criteria. I want to remind you all that the inclusion criteria is not only uh, cervical cancer with uh, tumor diameter less than 2 cm, but also uh, uh, cervical cancer with uh, less than 10 mm in stromal invasion on uh, uh, the con conization specimen or less than 50% stromal invasion on MRI scan. Patients were randomized to one-to-one uh, -to, -one to receive either radical hysterectomy or simple hysterectomy. The primary endpoint was the pelvic recurrence rate at three years. Here you can see the results uh, about the primary endpoint and you can see that uh, there was no significant difference in the two study groups. So the study showed the non-inferiority of simple hysterectomy to radical hysterectomy. We have a, a number of secondary endpoints. First of all, intraoperative complications. There was no difference in this endpoint. But regarding the post-operative complications, we can see that, particularly in the first 30 days post-operative, we uh, had a higher incidence of any adverse event in the radical hysterectomy group. In particular, we had a higher incidence of urinary incontinence and urinary retention in the radical hysterectomy group. Concerning patient reported outcomes, we can see that uh, in terms of quality of life and sexual health, there was for any of the items of the, the questionnaires, there was a better outcomes in favor of the simple hysterectomy group. In conclusion, in early stage low risk cervical cancer, pelvic recurrence rate at three years with simple hysterectomy was not inferior to radical hysterectomy. Fewer 
urological surgical complications following simple hysterectomy were recorded. Better quality of life and sexual health measures were seen following simple hysterectomy. So we can conclude that this trial supported the concept of surgical de-escalation in patients with tumors less than 2 cm but also with less than 10 mm depth of stromal infiltration at, in the cone specimen or less than 50% depth of infiltration in preoperative MRI scan. At ESCO Congress in Istanbul, Kristat Köhler, on behalf of the Centix study group, presented the lower limb lymphedema after sentinel lymph node in cervical cancer patients, the final results of the Centix prospective international study. The Centix trial is a prospective international multicenter observational trial conducted in 47 sites evaluating sentinel lymph node biopsy without pelvic lymph node dissection in patients with early stage cervical cancer. The primary endpoint was recurrence rate, but the main second endpoint was the postoperative morbidity, including lower limb lymphedema. And this is the endpoint which this particular sub study is referring to. Here you can have a glance of the uh, study procedures and ac uh, according to the methodology to measure the uh, lower limb you can see here the five circumferences which were measured at different time points of course before the surgery and after surgery after uh, different timelines. In terms of results, the analysis based on leg volume increase was performed and uh, uh, we can see here that, that persistent limb volume more than 40% was present in 1.8% in the sentinel lymph node court and 1.1% in the control court. Patient reporting subjective uh, lower limb lymphedema showed that uh, in the SLN court had significantly lower self-reported lymphedema compared to the co control cohort. In conclusion, replacement of standard pelvic lymph node dissection by bilateral sentinel lymph node biopsy is associated with lower rate of subjectively reported lower limb swelling, but it does not eliminate persistent limb volume increase. Moving on to ovarian cancer surgical trial updates, we will discuss about the KIPPOR trial and the LANCE trial. The KIPPOR trial was presented for the first time at ESGO Congress in Istanbul and it was presented by Dr. Pierre Meus and it involves the hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy in platinum sensitive relapsed epithelial ovarian cancer. The rationale is that uh, desktop 3 trial and SOC1 trial support the role of secondary site reductive surgery in platinum sensitive recurrent ovarian cancer, and HIPEC leads to high intraperitoneal concentration of platinum enhanced by hyperthermia. So, the hypothesis of the study is that HIPEC at time of secondary site reductive surgery after six cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is associated with longer overall survival compared to uh, secondary cell reductive surgery alone. So patients were included if they had the first relapse of epithelial ovarian cancer with platinum-free interval more than six months, response to six cycles of platinum-based chemotherapy, and complete surgery uh, achievable. So patients underwent surgery and during the surgery they were randomized to either receive IPEC with 75 mg per square meter of cisplatinum versus no HIPEC. The primary endpoint was the overall survival. And here we can see the, re the results from the primary endpoint in the intention to treat population. And we can see that the HIPEC group had a significantly improved overall survival compared to no HIPEC group 
with a hazard ratio of 0.69, which was statistically significant. In terms of secondary endpoint, there was a benefit also in terms of progression-free survival. Authors also looked at uh, secondary endpoints such as uh, intraoperative morbidity, uh, as well as uh, um, potential uh, adverse events related to the HIPEC, such as uh, the severe kidney failure, which was improved after the thiosulfate amendment. The KIPO trial concluded that adding IPEC to cytoreductive surgery after six cycles of second-line chemotherapy for patients with first late relapse of ovarian cancer significantly improved overall survival. The KIPO is the largest prospectively randomized trial showing an overall survival benefit from IPEC in relapsed ovarian cancer, of course, this treatment must be performed in specialized centers. I want also to present the results from the feasibility phase of the LANCE trial. The LANCE trial is an ongoing trial, an international prospective multicenter randomized non-inferiority phase 3 trial aiming to examine whether minimally invasive surgery is non-inferior to laparotomy in terms of disease-free survival in women with advanced ovarian cancer that received three to four cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Here you can see the study schema and the patients are randomized to receive either minimal invasive or open interval debulking surgery and then they continue the adjuvant chemotherapy. The results of the feasibility phase were presented by Jorge Alejandro Rao Howin uh, this year and uh, they showed uh, results from the first 100 patients randomized. Uh, actually, they showed uh, very uh, encouraging results as there were just 6.3% uh, uh, intraoperative complications in the minimal invasive group and 6.54% and in the open group. 4.1% minimally invasive surgery group experienced grade 4 and 5 adverse events. Surgeons ac achieved complete gross resection in 87.5 and 83% in the minimally invasive and open group respectively with no significant difference. In conclusion, the evaluation of minimally invasive interval cytoreductive sur surgery was considered feasible and the study can continue. Regarding endometrial cancer, we would like to discuss two uh, retrospective studies, but really interesting studies, which were presented and uh, published this year. The first study is called Seneca study which is the staging of endometrial cancer based on molecular classification. Uh, it was presented at ESGO Istanbul Congress in 2023 by Enrique Chacon. The rationale of this study is represented by the fact that endometrial cancer uh, can be classified in four different prognostic subgroups. The ESGO astro -ESP guidelines have adopted this classification to support adjuvant treatment, but the molecular classification of endometrial cancer, which has been recently been implemented, has not affected the surgical approach so far. So the hypothesis was to assess the central lymph node involvement rate for each molecular subtype in apparent uterine confined endometrial cancer and also to assess the central lymph node involvement for each prognostic subgroup. You can see here that uh, uh, 2,139 patients fulfilled the inclusion criteria and were analyzed. This is the primary endpoint outcome and we can see here that uh, we have the um, different uh, molecular subgroups where the central lymph node metastasis was significantly different in each subgroup with the highest rate of metastasis being present in the MMR deficient group and in the P53 mutated group. 
after this there, there was uh, the uh, highest uh, incidence in the multi-classifier group. We can see here that uh, this uh, molecular classification led to a different uh, risk group stratification with of course different uh, uh, risk of uh, um, uh, lymph node metastasis. And here we can have the, uh, the view of the area under the curve of uh, the uh, population with known and unknown molecular classification. And this is really interesting to see. In conclusion, the Seneca study showed uh, significant differences in central lymph node involvement among patients with early stage endometrial cancer based on their molecular subtypes, with the highest incidence in the MMR deficient and P53 abnormal groups. Prospective studies are needed to validate these findings. Another very interesting study has just been published in the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer, with first author being Giuseppe Cucinella from Italy, this is a large retrospective international multicenter study which analyzed the prognostic value of isolated tumor cells in sentinel lymph nodes in low risk endometrial cancer. We know that isolated tumor cells are defined as cells deposit with dimension not greater than 0.2 millimeters. This study found that Patients with central lymph node isolated tumor cells and low risk profile without adjuvant treatment had a significant worse recurrent free survival compared with node negative patients. Of course, this had to be adjusted for grade and uh, excluded patients with lymph vascular space invasion. There was no different difference in overall survival uh, in the two study groups, ITC and negative node patients. Concerning vulvar cancer, I want to report the surgical trial updates from uh, a study which aimed to expand the indication of sentinel lymph node. This is a prospective nationwide Swedish study was very recently published in the International Journal of Gynecological Cancer with first author being Diana Zak and uh, included 64 women with uh, the non-conventional indication to performing sentinel lymph node biopsy including tumors more than 4 cm, multifocal tumors, local recurrence with uh, uh, surgery before or local recurrence after radiotherapy. The study showed promising results with the detection rates varying between 94 and 100% per patient and no false negative case was identified. So this was very promising and opens the door to uh, uh, expanding the indication in, of sentinel lymph node in vulvar cancer. So in conclusion, we can say that uh, the surgical trial update for 2023 showed that SHAPE trial supports the discalation of, of surgery in low-risk cervical cancer. SENTIX trial showed the lower limb lymphedema persists also after a sentinel lymph node. The KIPO trial demonstrated that HIPEC at secondary cytoreductive surgery after six cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy improves overall survival. Lance trial demonstrated that uh, minimal invasive cyt uh, interval cytoreductive surgery is feasible. We had the Seneca study showing that a significant difference in sentinel lymph node metastasis in different molecular subgroups of endometrial cancer was demonstrated. Retrospective studies showed that ITCs 
had a, a prognostic role affecting recurrence in endometrial cancers, in cancer, and that the indication to sentinel lymph node in vulvar cancer might be expanded. With this, I want to take this opportunity to invite you all to the ESGO 2024 Congress, which will be held in Barcelona from the 7th to the 10th of March 2024. I really look forward to seeing you there. I want to thank you all for your attention and I want to thank Gil so much for the opportunity and the collaboration between OncoAlert and ESCO. I really enjoyed so much this time with you. I look forward to discussing with you anything you would like to ask. Dear colleague, dear friends, it's my great pleasure today to uh, prepare this uh, uh, presentation uh, concerning systemic therapy for uterine leiomyosarcoma. It is my current disclosure. Unfortunately, there is no disclosure for leiomyosarcoma uh, and in particular for uterine sarcoma. If we would like to discuss about this topic, we need to remember incidence and epidemiology. And as you know, it is a, a very rare disease. Approximately 1% of all uterine uh, uh, cancer and one of the most common subtype when we speak about uh, sarcoma. In the reality, the uh, highest incidence in the group age of 45 to 60 years old. And as you can see on the uh, slide, the um, poor uh, uh, survival outcome we can report for uterine leiomyosarcoma completely related to the FIGO stage. And when we look to this stage four disease, for example, the uh, five years disease specific survival is less than 30%. The exact cause is really unknown. There is some malignant transformation of the pre-exciting benign fibroid, but it is controversial. And the risk factor already published in the literature is not related to the parity. We can discuss about the history of uh, prior uh, pelvic radiation. There is also some data to considering that age, obesity, diabetes, the use of tamoxifen and smoking could be uh, some risk factor considering uh, uh, environment. But in terms of biology, uh, the Gardner syndrome and the Lee-Fraumeni syndrome are probably the most important risk factor. Considering uh, the survival, we have to resolve something that already we are not clear on the fact is, is there any difference between uterine leiomyosarcoma and soft tissue sarcoma? And interestingly, there is now two papers in the literature who report that unfortunately the uterine leiomyosarcoma have a lower uh, uh, survival in terms of overall, but also in terms of pro progression pre survival uh, rate compared to a soft tissue sarcoma. And if you look at the most recent publication considering the French. A group, you can see that the difference is clearly statistically significant. And one of the explanations is unfortunately the routine practice and more particularly the risk of mortalization we have when we consider uterine sarcoma. And it could be the reason to explain why the PFS is lower for uterine sarcoma. Considering the biology, as you can see, there is a great publication from the TCGA. We look at the soft tissue sarcoma versus uterine leiomyosarcoma. And as you can see, finally, in terms of biology, we have more similar uh, uh, alteration compared soft tissue and uterine, looking to P53, RB1, P10, than in all other uh, uh, sarcoma. However, they have seen something interesting in terms of uh, RNA sequencing. There is two different clusters. One, particularly uh, 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 higher represented in uterine sarcoma, in the hypermethylated uh, cluster, where we look at more uh, frequently CCN2 amplification, DNA replication, and repair alteration, RB1 mutation, and close to 85% uh, of these patients have uh, uh, a CATE pathway alteration. At the opposite, in the C2 cluster, where there is more frequently hypomethylated, we also see 
some uh, signature of inflammatory cell, including uh, natural killer cell, promoting some immune uh, microenvironment. And in this case, there is only 44% of AKT alteration. Could be something interesting in the future. As mentioned before, one of the big difficulties is the diagnosis. And the majority of these patients, unfortunately, receive mortalization because the initial surgery does not anticipate that it could be a sarcoma. I don't want to move too much in the detail, but I would like to report this French publication where we have seen that including a percutaneous uterine biopsy with uh, uh, CGA analysis, we are able to clearly identify malignant uh, uh, tumor compared to benign or uncertain, and we have a specificity and a negative predictive value of 100% in this publication, but it could be perhaps the future for uh, this tumor to be sure that when we start the surgery, we know that we are treating a sarcoma or a benign lesion. Considering the standard of care, uh, uh, for the localized disease, the treatment starts with surgery. And we did not anticipate specific chemotherapy or radiotherapy for all of the patients. The standard of care include an end block surgery. Bilateral salpingo ophorectomy uh, is in general proposed for peri uh, and postmenopausal women. And there is no data to consider systematic lymph node dissection. In terms of chemotherapy, the, the different uh, data in the literature are really poor. We have already uh, two different phase three trials. The first one published in 1985, considering doxorubicin versus observation. This trial, who include more than 200 patients, but also carcinosarcoma, did not report positive effect in terms of PFS and overall survival. The, um, the French group, start a large phase three, the SAR gene. Uh, unfortunately, this trial stopped the recruitment because of low recruitment and was not able to uh, include the uh, more than 200 uh, patients as we would like to confirm the role of uh, chemotherapy in addition of radiotherapy. However, if we see some benefit in terms of PFS, the overall survival data were not uh, significant, and we have to report two uh, toxic deaths in this clinical trial. The last one coming from the GOG as a pure clinical trial, exploring a combination of GEMTAX plus doxorubicin versus observation for FIGO stage one uterine leiomyosarcoma. We need to include more than 200 uh, patients. Unfortunately, only uh, 338 uh, patients were finally included at the international level. And what we have seen in terms of results, if we uh, don't see any difference in terms of PFS for, in, 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 um, uh, for chemotherapy, in the uh, overall survival data, we see the opposite. And also, we have very few patients. This data did not encourage uh, uh, the clinician to continue to explore uh, systemic chemotherapy uh, for all patients before to understand who could be the, the, the good uh, uh, candidate. Considering the indication of uh, radiotherapy, we have a large phase three who did not report benefit to had systematically radiotherapy for this patient. And our guidelines we published in uh, uh, 2014 did not consider systemic radiotherapy for this patient. In the more advanced disease, we have some efficacy in terms of chemotherapy, looking to combination as gemcitabine, doxorubicin, or uh, uh, gemcitabine plus to set Axel. We also have some efficacy looking to trabectidine, pazopani, and dacarbazine as monotherapy. But as you can see, the response rate, the median PFS, and the overall survival is always less than uh, 18 months. Considering the, the drug interesting for leiomyosarcoma, there is this retrospective data from EURTC who report that finally, the combination of doxorubicin plus dacarbazine seems to be particularly interesting considering other uh, association as doxorubicin and ifosfamid or doxorubicin alone. However, the data are retrospective and we need to have a large prospective data to consider this combination as to be a standard of care. Chemotherapy with doxorubicin alone remain our standard of care. Effectively, we have this large phase three, the JD trial, including doxorubicin 
docetaxel plus gemcitabine compared to doxorubicin. This trial, unfortunately, did not report benefit for the combination compared to the monotherapy in terms of PFS and overall survival, but more uh, side effect than doxorubicin alone. For uterine leiomyosarcoma, uh, Marty and Slay explore also the combination of taxoter plus gemcitabine plus or less BEV uh, in this indication. Unfortunately, this phase three was negative and there is no benefit to have a bevacizumab in this population. And we have more recently this phase two with uh, uh, LMSO2, doxorubicin plus trabectidine, reporting nice response rate and a good median PFS who uh, uh, gives some indication to consider a, a more advanced large phase three. And effectively, it is the LMS O4 report uh, uh, two years ago by Patricia Potti at ESMO. This trial includes uterine lyomyosarcoma and soft tissue sarcoma and uh, in, uh, randomized patient with the combination of doxorubicin plus trabectidine followed by trabectidine alone versus doxorubicin alone. The results were positive for the PFS with a good hazard ratio of 0.38, a median PFS of more than one year with the combination. There is more uh, uh, objective response rate in the combination arm compared to the monotherapy, but also more side effect with more uh, hematological toxicity and more digestive side effect with the combination. However, there is no overall survival data uh, at that time in terms of uh, uh, follow-up. And the update this year was reported again at the ESMO 2023, where we see, we confirm the response rate. We also see that adding more response rate with the combination, we observe more surgery after six cycles with the combination compared to the monotherapy. And what it was interesting to see is that the overall survival data were positive in favor of the combination with an other ratio of 0.65. Also, we know that there is uh, uh, several patients who receive trabectidine in the control arm after the progression. So we have positive uh, large phase three in this population with uh, uh, sarcoma. And when we look at the uh, uh, subgroup analysis, you can see that there is a similar result for uterine and non-uterine uh, uh, sarcoma. The other ratio is similar considering the overall survival benefit. After failure uh, of uh, anthracycline, what could be the possibility to, to propose to the patient? The trabectidine monotherapy remains a good alternative. We, there is some data to consider gemcitabine plus or less docetaxel or dacarbazine. And we have the combination of gemcitabine plus dacarbazine who report to be better than carbazine. Dacarbazine alone. There is also some data to consider hormonal treatment, antiangiogenic aspazopanib, and the question is also about immune therapy for this patient. Considering TKI, we have the possibility, and I hope that this trial will be reported uh, this year or next year, to explore the use of cabozantinib after response uh, to uh, doxorubicin-based chemotherapy in the first-line setting. It will be perhaps something interesting uh, to consider for the future. Considering uh, the capability to uh, increase the efficacy of TKI in uterine lyomyosarcoma, as I remember you, the pazopanib, the response rate for uterine lyomyosarcoma are not so good, 11% of response rate, median PFS, three months. And in this context, uh, the lambatinib with also a TKI targeting VHFR, FGFR, and PDGFR was explored in addition to a ribulin. And this combination report a good response rate of 28%, who, who seems to be particularly interesting compared to uh, pazopanib alone. In such concept, context, there is also some data to consider uh, PARP inhibitor. Effectively, uterine lyomyosarcoma uh, have some defective DNA damage repair, uh, no, notably in the homologous recombination pathway. And as you can see, more importantly than in the soft tissue sarcoma, as I mentioned before. And in such context, there is some data to consider olaparib plus temozolomid in a phase two uh, uh, trial report at the uh, ASCO meeting, where again, the response rate was 27% and the median duration of response of close to one month, who seems to be particularly interesting 
And we have to say that the majority of the patients who have response to treatment, uh, we observe some homologous recombination deficiency in this population that can be uh, explored using uh, RAD51 FOSI, who can be able to report this homologous recombination deficiency. There is also some data to consider that uh, uh, this homologous recombination deficiency can result in dependency on non-homologous and joint deficient. And in this context, we can ask if DNA PK plus ATR inhibitor could be interesting. Considering PD-1 inhibitor, there is not clear data to consider that it will be interesting. Nivolumab and pembrolizumab did not report uh, response uh, for uterine leiomyosarcoma or leiomyosarcoma in general. And we have now the, the, the results of the translational research who report that effectively there is no mutational burden uh, in this population. The mismatch repair deficiency is more than uh, rare. And when we look at the tumor microenvironment, we see that there is few infiltration by immune cell, particularly B cell and, and CD8 positive T cell compared to other leiomyosarcoma, probably PD1 inhibitor, us also in combination will not be so interesting. So in terms of hormonal treatment, there is also some data for uterine leiomyosarcoma with ER or PR positivity. There is also, remember, this mTOR inhibitor in the large petri report a good response rate for leiomyosarcoma. It will be interesting to explore uh, deeper uh, in this particular population of uterine leiomyosarcoma where there is P3 kinase alteration. We have recently seen some data considering olaparib plus trabectidine with a response rate of 14%. And this year, the Italian group reported the Thomas II trial who are unfortunately negative versus trabectidine alone at ESMO. However, this subgroup analysis is a postdoc analysis using uh, 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 instable, instable uh, uh, score uh, to determine homologous recombination deficiency seems to report interesting data for the combination in this subgroup of patients. This need for sure to be uh, uh, confirmed in the future. We are also waiting for ongoing trial. I already mentioned the cabozantinib trial uh, uh, post uh, chemotherapy. We also have the Saludo phase three, phase three trial exploring the lubinertinine plus doxorubicin versus doxorubicin alone. It's a large trial, and I hope it will be positive and we have the opportunity to have this combination in the near future. And we also see some interesting data with Dakarbazin and the ns bulin with also uh, a tubulin inhibitor who report nice results in terms of response rate and duration uh, uh, of uh, uh, response with long stabilization. And this combination is currently explored versus Dakarbazine in a phase two, phase three trial uh, after first line. Again, it will be interesting to have these results for the future. So my conclusion, considering optimal therapy for uterine myomyosarcoma is that to consider to refer this patient to expert center for the surgery, but also you have seen now for uh, the initial diagnosis, we have the opportunity to help this patient. In relapse setting, the LMS04 with doxorubicin and trabectidine is the first randomized trial beating doxorubicin alone for PFS and overall survival. This needs to be integrated in our decision making. There is also other option that it can include doxorubicin alone, doxo plus the, uh, the carbazine or gem uh, uh, taxotere, depending on the access to drug and clinical factor. And we need to continue to explore new drug and new strategy to have an access to this clinical trial I already mentioned before, plus uh, adding other and targeting DNA damage with their pathway and the downturn consequence on RB1, P53, P10, and Aterix uh, loss could be really interesting for uterine leiomyosarcoma. I think that exploring instability score and homologous for combination deficiency could be particularly interesting in uterine leiomyosarcoma, and we need to continue in this way. I would like to thank all of you for your interest to uh, uh, look at uterine leiomyosarcoma, and I hope to help you to treat your patient. Thank you so much for your attention.
Dear colleagues, uh, my talk is about the role of predictive biomarkers in gynecological malignancy treatment in regards to endocrine therapy. So I'll talk about uh, biomarkers in general, then in endocrine therapy, and then I'll give an overview of endocrine therapy trials in gynecological cancers. So biomarkers, um, the definition is that it is a measurement of a variable of some biological state or condition. And, and in this function, it is an indicator of normal or pathological changes or responses to a certain exposure. It is normally a single message, mes measurement, but it can be a signature or a classifier, which is computed from various or numerous variables. Um, a biomarker can be diagnostic, it can be pharmacodynamic, predictive, prognostic, and a marker of safety. Um, so this is an example, for instance, for a progesterone receptor in breast, in various different kinds of breast cancer. And this is an example of a prognostic biomarker. It's used to identify the likelihood of a clinical event in our Example, it's the probability of distant recurrences. Um, it informs about a likely cancer outcome, and then, namely how many recurrences will occur during the years after the diagnosis. Uh, it can also uh, be an indicator of disease progression or death, and it's independent of any treatment received. A predictive biomarker that is very important because predictive biomarkers are very um, are really what we look for in clinical trials because then we it allows us to do a targeted treatment approach. Um, for instance, in this example on the right hand side, in patients who have an EGFR mutation um, and you give them an EGFR uh, inhibitor, uh, you have a better outcome than in patients who have a placebo. So it predicts, actually, the fact that they have the mutation predicts that they will respond better to the drug which targets this specific mutation. So it predicts a favorable or unfavorable effect from the exposure. It's important for enrichment strategies in the design because then we know we're actually targeting um, something specific when we give this drug. And um, it requires a rigorous assessment. So ideally, it's assessed in a randomized controlled trials. And by enrolling patients due to predictive biomarker, this gives us a clearer signal that treatment is likely to work. And this is a very important biomarker in endocrine therapy because here we're using estrogen receptor, for instance. So uh, the receptors and genes for estrogen uh, endocrine therapy were early discovered in the 1920s. You can see here the discovery of estrone, then of estradiol, and then of the estrogen receptor. And on the, this is the basis that we can treat an estrogen, that we can do endocrine therapy these days. So estrogen receptors in the female body react with different receptors. You can see here the different organs and the different receptors which are expressed in the various organs for us of interest, the ovary receptor alpha beta, uterus alpha and beta. And you can see here also how it works, uh, endogen receptors in a normal cell. You have the estrogen from ex exocellular, and then you have your receptor here. It binds to the receptor. And then what happens that it binds in the end to the DNA. So estrogen, um, and it triggers then the proliferation. So estrogen al receptor alpha activ is activated by the sex hormone estrogen, and it is encoded by gene ESR1 on chromosome 6. And, and this ESR1 is important. I'll get back to that later on. Then we have the estrogen receptor beta, uh, also activation by sex hormones. It encodes gene ESR2. We have also ER gamma, which we don't hear very often. Um, there's no physiological activating ligand known, and the encoding gene is ESRR. Um, and there are certain inverse agonists um, to ER gamma. When we look at the ESR1 gene, which encodes for ER alpha, we can see here in the very big TCGA pan can data set of 527 patients that it is highest expressed in breast, following by the endometrium and then the ovary, which fits to the former figure. Uh, when we look again in this data set on disease-free survival and relapse-free survival, what we don't want is that it necessarily correlates with outcome. What we see is that ESR1 
um, here highly expressed, uh, if, you, if you look at our lowest expressed, uh, if you look at the red and highest expressed, if you look in the purple, you can see here that there's no difference in disease-free survival and no statistically significant difference in relapse-free, in disease-free survival, and perhaps a slight but not significant well, a significant difference here in the relapse-free survival between the two biggest groups. Um, when we look on the protein level, and this is a, a very big um, collection of over 4,000 uh, patients, um, you can see by immunohistochemistry, the ER expression is biggest in uterine, in the liver, diaphragm, the breast, brain. So you can see these are the areas, the tissues, which have the highest estrogen receptor expression. So not the DEAN, but the protein expression, estrogen receptor. And this is another trial looking in epithelial ovarian cancers. We all know from the data of Gershon said that particularly low grade serous uh, ovarian cancers have the highest expression, but actually also the high grades have a relatively high expression and the endometroid ovarian cancers. When we look um, again on the estrogen protein level, estrogen receptor protein level um, of the different estrogen receptors in FIGO stages of ovarian cancer, um, you can see this is FIGO 1, 2, FIGO 3, 4. You can see there is the biggest significant difference in the estrogen receptor gamma. All the other twos are more or less expressed in early and in advanced stage. So there's really no difference in the expression depending on FIGO stage. So um, the question is now, is actually the estrogen receptor expression on the protein level prognostic biomarker in epithelial and ovarian cancer? And the answer is, well, estrogen receptor alpha and gamma are present in over 90% of ovarian cancer. Alpha did not affect progression-free survival and overall survival, um, but beta and gamma had a significant effect in worse progression-free survival and overall survival. And on multivariate analysis, and you see that on the top, ER gamma is an independent prognostic marker for ovarian uh, cancer survival. This is very important because if you want to, if you look at a drug which targets this receptor, you don't want that there is an indirect effect, if you want, from actually the fact that the receptor by itself has a prognostic effect. So on mRNA level, you can see here that the highest expression is actually in estrogen receptor alpha in the tumor compared to normal. And this is again a TCGA data set. Um, are there any measurements beyond receptors? Yeah, I mean, positive ER staining does not reliably predict therapy response, um, but there is an evaluated prediction in a trial um, uh, where they quantify a functional ER pathway. And what they do is actually they do fresh frozen tissue, do an FMetrix test, that is this thing here on the left, and then they use FFPEs and do RT-PCR, and they have shown that they can do a very good uh, um, prediction of response. Um, this is actually what they show. Um, this is their result. They show that one third of the ER positive patients had a functionally inactive ER pathway activity score, and they could find responders in blue and non-responders in red at different time points under treatment. So this is a quite good uh, possibility to measure the effect of a treatment. So. So you see that um, actually because we have uh, ER, we have ESR, DEANS, uh, endocrine therapy is actually quite um, an easy and, and feasible um, target for treatment in gynecological cancers. And um, we know from endo, uh, ovarian cancer, there are various trials, phase two trials, using endocrine treatment in recurrent ovarian cancer. It's actually a huge amount of trials who have tried that. Um, this is a meta-analysis where they examined all those 53 phase two trials, and overall they saw a clinical benefit rate of 41. The problem with those all those trials is that they treated them. So this was meant as a treatment, not as a maintenance treatment as a real treatment um, and uh, there was huge heterogeneity in all those trials they were heavily pretreated patients and mostly we had no information about the ER expression in those trials so they treated them without knowing the ER or at least they didn't report about them 
So the Paragon trial by, uh, designed by Professor Michael Friedlander from Sydney, that was a basket trial um, where they incorporated seven phase two trials. The drug they studied was an anastrozole and aromatase inhibitor. Um, and they used patients who had ER positive and or PR positive uh, recurrent metastatic gynae cancers. And the primary endpoint was a clinical benefit rate at three months. Um, and they, they had different outcomes depending on the cohort they examined. And you can see here in recurrent, as a biochemically recurrent ovarian cancer, which were asymptomatic, um, they had a clinical benefit rate of 34.6%, so three months. Um, they had in the recurrent platinum sensitive or refractory ovarian cancers, they had a clinical benefit rate of 27%. Um, so that wasn't, there, there was a, a response, but not that overwhelming. In low grade ovarian cancer, where we already know that patients will not respond to standard chemotherapy with carbotaxel, uh, we have those, for instance, those neoadjuvant data, which have shown that there is no use in low grade serious cancer to use neoadjuvant chemo. Um, we know from the Gershenson data, this is retrospective cohort, but nevertheless, we know that there is a benefit um, of giving endocrine therapy in low-grade ovarian cancers, and we can see a PFS and OS survival benefit. So um, the question is really, uh, so there seems to be a benefit of this treatment. Perhaps it's better in the adjuvant setting. In the adjuvant setting, um, there are two trials examining this at the moment, the US NRG GYO19 trial in newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancers, low grade. They do the cytoreduction reduction and then they're randomized in one arm where they give standard chemotherapy, six cycles followed by aromatase inhibitor letrozole versus letrozole only without chemo. And the other trial is uh, uh, our Swiss trial where I'm the international PI, the same group of patients, but also high grade endometroid ovarian cancers allowed. Here we randomize after after chemo, after chemotherapy um, and debulking into an arm with letrozole versus an arm of placebo and maintenance with BEF and PARP inhibitor is allowed. And we're still recruiting. Now, coming back again to the Paragon trials in the low grades, for instance, in the ones who respond really well. Well, really good response in this basket trial in the recurrent low grade setting, recurrent low grade metastatic setting was giving an estrosol. You can see here the benefit rate much different. It's 64 months in low grade serous ovarian cancers and in serous borderline tumor 61. And in recurrent low grade um, endometrial stromal sarcoma, we see an even better response of 73 months. Um, not such a big response to triple MTs and leiomyosarcoma, but a very, very good, actually the best response to recurrent granulosa cell tumors with 79% clinical benefit rate. Um, the, the, the final group they examined was recurrent endometrial cancers. Uh, there, there was a clinical benefit rate better than in the general ovarian cancers, but not particularly strong. So there has been a huge progress in breast cancer in HR positive, and that's our advantage in gynae cancer that we can go back and look at all the breast cancer data. We have SERMs, the tamoxifen, we have uh, the um, aromatase inhibitors, um, we have Fulvestrand assert, and now we have CDK4-6 inhibitors, which have started. So it makes sense to use also that in, in gynae cancers, in ovarian cancers, for instance, in low-grade uh, serous ovarian cancers, there you can see you can work with anastrozole, with, with letrozole. Um, you can also work with tamoxifen and fulvestrand. But the other option is actually anti-androgens, bevacizumab, and then the whole cascade here of uh, all those PIK3 kinase, mTOR inhibitors, or REF, BREF, MEC inhibitors, or you go directly to the end of this line, to the cyclin, to the CDK4-6 inhibitors. And that's exactly what they've done here in breast cancer. So it probably makes sense also in gynae cancers. Now, um, I've shown you the, that before, I've shown you the response to endometrial cancer in the Paragon trying. There has been another trial um, where they didn't only use the aromatase inhibitor, in this case, letrozole, but also this 
CDK46, this one here, the CDK46 inhibitor, pulvociclib, and uh, it was in recurrent metastatic endometrial cancer like the other cohort, and they had a benefit of 46 versus 38 months. So <clears throat> you would imagine the difference doesn't seem to be that much different, so that one could argue probably the benefit comes actually mostly from the letrozole, not so much from the pulvociclib. But this is an inter-trial comparison, which is really not allowed. What I really like for the future would be to have predictive biomarkers to perhaps use then CDK4-6 inhibitor to then target if someone has a mutation, go really individually, depending on the mutation that someone has, or depending on the response that someone has on a certain drug. And perhaps also in the future, go and look actually in the genes. Look um, if a gene is mutated and perhaps define by this which patient will respond to the treatment. So I'm concluding endocrine therapy offers many benefits, including oral dosing, fewer side effects, and a lot of the other maintenance drugs. There is the opportunity for longer exposure given the lack of chronic toxicity. There's a benefit from endocrine therapy, particularly in endometrial stromal sarcoma, granulosa cell tumors, and low-grade serous ovarian cancers. The endocrine therapy has mostly been used in the recurrent active treatment phase, and only now we're doing trials, which will prove if they make any sense to be given in the maintenance phase, in the initial treatment maintenance phase, as, you know, as, as after diagnosis. Um, combination treatments and better predictive biomarkers will be essential for targeting any advances in the future. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about today a very useful tool which can help for patients, caregivers, and also for healthcare professionals on the whole patient pathway. My name is Isoto. I'm from Hungary, from the Mellowflower Foundation, and from ESGO Engage. We are all facing the rise of the digital world in healthcare. We have been helping patients in the online world for quite some time. It existed before, but today there are also solutions that manage the patient, speed up time, and make additional options available. We are really helpful in the online world these days, but personal care shouldn't be totally digital care. Personal presence and contacts are necessary. We are also human being. So therefore, we have to redefine care under the umbrella of personalized healthcare. We need a patient-centric and smart healthcare system. But how can the patient groups join this all? We have to continue our personal care and also at the digital solution. But never forget that patient advocacy groups support healthcare professionals too, their work, saving time, and sometimes showing directions. So we created Olivia, which is a digital patient pathway guide in ovarian cancer. You can see Olivia here. So we created Olivia under the umbrella of the ovarian cancer commitment, which is um, established by the European Society of Gynecological Oncology, also the European Network of Gynecological Cancer Advocacy Groups, and AstraZeneca. Olivia is the first project of the ovarian cancer commitment. The inspiration uh, came from the Hungarian Association, the Mallow Flower Foundation. I am the president of this, and we are engaged members. So as a patient organization, we have seen that we have many helpful elements, but somehow patients do not find all of them when they need it. That's why we want to, to include it in 
somehow I can say in one unit. So when we travel somewhere, we turn on the GPS, right? Waze or Google, for example. Practically, this shows the way on the map. So we can plan where we will stop, for example, to rest or which settlements we pass through. The patient pathway guide was born from this idea as it is very important for the patient to concentrate on a given station, for example, chemotherapy or in surgery, to receive all the authentic and useful information here, but also to see her options. So we um, have a really nice film which introduced the pathway guide itself. So please meet Olivia. Hello, I'm Itzo Tot. I'm a cancer survivor and the president of the Mellow Flower Foundation in Hungary. Welcome to Olivia. Olivia has been created by the European Society of Gynecological Oncology, ESGO, the European Network of Gynecological Cancer Advocacy Groups, ENGAGE, and AstraZeneca as a part of our ovarian cancer commitment to support everyone affected by ovarian cancer, whether you are living with ovarian cancer yourself or are caring for someone who is. I will leave it to Olivia to tell you how she can help you. Hello and welcome. I'm Olivia, your guide in learning about ovarian cancer. I know this is a challenging time for you and your family, and I'm here to help. This website contains a lot of information, so I recommend getting relaxed and comfortable, making yourself a cup of tea or coffee, and taking your time as you explore. You can always come back whenever you need to. If you have just been diagnosed, I recommend you first read my guide for newly diagnosed patients. Here you'll find articles that could help support you during the first steps of living with ovarian cancer. This section also contains some medical information to help answer any questions you might not have had time to ask your doctor about yet. Next, you could visit the stories page. Everyone whose life has been affected by ovarian cancer has their own story about their experience. I've asked my friends to share theirs with you. I hope you can take some comfort from seeing that you aren't alone. This section will expand over time. So please come back and check out new updates. As your own experience with ovarian cancer evolves, your needs will change. So I've created the Ovarian Cancer Pathway to help you understand everything that's coming. Just click on the link titled About the Pathway, which is split into four parts. If you have just been diagnosed or want to refresh your understanding of the basics, go to About Ovarian Cancer. This section of the pathway contains information about the science behind ovarian cancer and how it's diagnosed. If you are currently undergoing treatment or are just about to start, then primary treatment could be more useful for you. Many of you might worry about surgery and chemotherapy, but I hope I can support you in learning what to expect. If you've already finished primary treatment, ongoing care could help you think about what comes next. The physical and emotional effects of ovarian cancer can follow you into remission so I hope these articles help you to feel more prepared for the future. Finally, if your ovarian cancer has returned, you may have questions about how your treatment experience could change. The recurrence section should provide a good starting point for discussions with your healthcare team. The ovarian cancer pathway section you select will be highlighted in yellow. Scroll across the visual pathway to access each topic, and once you reach the end, you'll be able to move on by clicking the next section button. At any point, you will be able to view the full pathway, which will give you quick access to each of the pathway's areas. If you are stuck or need some help, please click on the Need Help button for answers to frequently asked questions. I know there's a lot to take in, so go at your own pace. You don't need to read everything all at once. I understand that there's more to ovarian cancer than medical information. It can affect many aspects of your life, 
and some of the articles in the Living with Ovarian Cancer section could help you to understand more about the impact your diagnosis can have on your family, work, fertility and menopause and what you might be able to do to cope. Finally, the resources page can direct you to additional educational materials and a directory of patient advocacy groups that can offer you even more personal guidance and support closer to home. If you're not sure how to find what you're looking for, scroll down to the questions section of the home page or click the magnifying glass icon in the top right corner to search for keywords. Thank you for watching. I will be here as often as you need me and hope that our website will be an ongoing source of support to you throughout your experience. Just to summarize that we have some key drivers like high quality and accessible information, ovarian cancer management advice, and an interactive tool as well. And the structure, uh, there are five key sections, the newly diagnosed for newly diagnosed patients, ovarian cancer pathway interactive tool. This is the exact map. Living with ovarian cancer researchers. Here are some brochures and also leaflets, patient stories directory, and also patient advocacy directory. Uh, patient can find the patient advocacy group in their country in Europe. So engaged members are here and can be found. We had an official lunch of Olivia in Berlin in 2022. You can see here some pictures. It was really nice and it was really great to introduce Olivia for ESGO doctors and also for engaged members. You can see here a life-size cartoon Olivia and a photo wall and we had presentations and also we used Olivia on our badge as well. The communication is crucial. It's very important uh, to have it continuously. So we help patients all over Europe to find help, to find Olivia. And we have all the time campaigns on social media and of course post uh, ESGO Congress. We have usually press release and presentation. We have the website, we have uh, Olivia on ESGO website and uh, also Ovarian Cancer Commitment website. Uh, it's very important that not just the patient advocacy groups promote Olivia, but also the healthcare professionals as well. Uh, so we have a lot of press release and we have a lot of uh, posts and, and a high media outreach, which is also really important. And we haven't stopped here. So we are continuing the work with Olivia, not just updating the site when we have some professional uh, content, content, but uh, we really want Olivia to have in several languages. In 2023, we translated it and, uh, and of course we uh, made the content uh, available uh, in, in the country's practice as well. So we have it now in Turkish language, German, Swiss, and we have Austrian Olivia as well. In last year, we had the uh, Turkish lunch in Istanbul, and we want to continue, of course, these translations. I brought some uh, quotes from patients who are using Olivia, and they are really nice. We have really nice feedbacks. For example, 12 years ago for me, nothing like this was available. Information websites were often scary and focusing on the negative. Olivia totally turns this around. Or I think this is a perfect tool for us. 
living with ovarian cancer. I have never seen such an interactive application that made me feel welcome, warm, and comfortable. You can find Olivia, the ovarian.chinicancer.org. Please visit and use Olivia. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Laura de Kosser. I'm a medical oncologist at UZ Brussels, Brussels, Belgium, where I am responsible for the treatment of lung cancer. I have a special interest in geriatric oncology, and as such, I'm a board member of the International Society of Geriatric Oncology, or SIOC, as well as chair of their Science and Educational Committee. Today, I will give you an update on geriatric oncology. And this is my agenda of today. I will discuss randomized controlled trials in geriatric oncology, followed by the recently updated ASCO guidelines in geriatric oncology. I will also discuss some studies on patient priorities and finally end with some take-home messages. But before starting, I really wanted to show you this paper by Wesley Garner published in the Journal of Geriatric Oncology in 2023, where you can see that the older cancer population is increasing with patients over 65 years um, comprom comprising about 70% of all new cancer diagnoses in the future. And even patients older than 85 are increasing. So there really is a silver tsunami coming at us. Um, and we as medical oncologists should be prepared to give these patients the most optimal care that we can have. And for this, I really believe that uh, randomized controlled trials in geriatric oncology can guide us because they build evidence on the use of comprehensive geriatric assessment in older patients with cancer. We already had some evidence from prospective observational studies that showed that using a comprehensive geriatric assessment in older patients with cancer helps us to detect multiple problems, which we do not detect by a usual consultation, which may change our treatment plans, which has pro prognostic information with regards to life expectancy, but also predictive information with regards to chemotherapy toxicity by using the CARC tool or functional outcome. And finally, which leads to interventions with an adapted care plan, personalized plan for these older population. But of course, in oncology, we like to see randomized controlled trials. And since 2020, we now have more and more of these trials being published or presented at meetings. So these are the first five trials that were published, and you can see that in all these trials, there's quite a number of uh, patients, um, usually at the start of systemic treatment. And all of these patients had a comprehensive geriatric assessment and then were randomized between an intervention arm where um, this comprehensive uh, geriatric assessment and recommendations led to interventions, while um, in the control arm, there was the usual care. And this really had an impact on different outcomes that are important for the patients. So this is one of the first randomized controlled trials published in the JAMA Oncology in 2020 by Supriya Mohili, and this is the COACH study. Here, not only patients were included, but also caregivers and oncologists. And um, in the intervention arm, patients had a comprehensive geriatric assessment and the results and recommendations were provided to the oncologist. And the, what we saw was that patients in the intervention arm were more satisfied with communication about aging related problems, as well as more satisfied with overall care. In addition, the caregivers were also more satisfied with communication. So another randomized controlled trial is a GAP-70 study, also published by Supriya Mohili in The Lancet in 2021. In this, patients, in this uh, study, patients aged 70 years or more with an incurable solid tumor or lymphoma starting a new treatment regimen, as well as um, having at least one impairment on the geriatric assessment, were randomized between the intervention arm where the results of the comprehensive geriatric assessment with the impairments and recommendations were provided to the oncologist. 
And uh, on the other side, the control arm where there was usual care. So the oncologists were not um, knowing about uh, the results of the comprehensive geriatric assessment. And here you can see that in this um, study, um, in the intervention arm, there were less grade three to five toxicities um, because of chemotherapy. And this was a decrease with, 50, uh, with 20%. In addition, the survival was similar, but there were more dose reductions at cycle one and less dose reductions for further on during treatment. The second study is the GAIN study. Um, where patients aged 65 years or more with a solid tumor starting a new chemotherapy were included and were randomized between either the intervention arm with a CGA-driven multidisciplinary team that was uh, leading the interventions uh, or the control arm where the patients had usual care. And again, we saw a decrease with 10% of grade 3 to 5 toxicity due to chemotherapy in the intervention group. Um, a similar thing was seen in the Jericho study. And here, this was patients with a colorectal cancer, um, aged 70 years or more, starting adjuvant or first-line palliative chemotherapy. These were also vulnerable patients based on the results of a screening tool, um, the G8. Um, and again, patients that received CGA-based interventions had a higher completion rate of planned chemotherapy without those reductions or delay during uh, the treatment. And this was a, an increase of about 20%. And then we have the INTEGRATE study, um, same patient population, 70 years or more, solid tumor or uh, diffuse large cell B cell lymphoma planned for chemotherapy, targeted therapy or immunotherapy, randomized between an intervention arm with um, CGA and oncogeriatric care versus the usual care. And here the primary endpoint was health-related quality of life. And during treatment, there was a lower decline in health-related quality of life in the intervention uh, group. So in 2023, we had new randomized control trials that were uh, presented at several, at several meetings, um, uh, as well as uh, the RSIOC annual meeting. And the first here was the G-Oncocoach study, which um, was a Belgian study um, where patients aged 70 years or more with solid tumors starting systemic therapy were included. And in this study, patients in the intervention arm had a comprehensive geriatric assessment where interventions were coordinated by the geriatric team. Uh, and they also had intensive patient coaching in an attempt to increase um, patients' compliance to the interventions. In the control arm, there was usual care, so um, the CGA results were communicated to the oncology team, but the coordination of interventions was left to the oncology team. And the primary endpoint here was quality of life at six months. And you see that um, in the intervention arm, there was an increase in quality of life with 4.5 points, while in the um, control arm, there was a decrease in quality of life with 8.2 points uh, at six months. And this led that there was a statistically and clinically significant difference between the two arms of 12.8 points in favor of the intervention arm. At SIOC, we also saw the primary results of the CARGO study, where patients aged 65 years or older with advanced esophagus, stomach or biliary tract cancer starting chemotherapy were included. And interesting here is that um, patients in the intervention arm had a chemotherapy dose, which was based on the toxicity risk as assessed by the CARG tool. While in the control arm, all patients receive chemotherapy at 100% starting dose. Just, just to remind you, the CARG tool, um, this is a tool that can help you to calculate chemotherapy-related toxicity. It was uh, developed by late Arti Huria and published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2011. 
And you see that there's age, there's cancer type, there's chemotherapy dosing, or if whether you're using um, single chemotherapy or polychemotherapy, there are also some lamp values, but there's also some geriatric domains, such as um, falls, if a patient can take his own medication, if a patient can take a block and social contact. And what we see is that um, if you have an increasing score, you also have an increasing risk of C chemotherapy toxicity, and you can calculate that risk um, based on this tool. So in the CARGO trial, um, patients that had low risk received 100% of chemotherapy dose in the intervention arm, while patients that had a moderate risk received 80%, and patients that had a high risk of chemotherapy-related toxicity received 60% of the dose at start. And interestingly, there was absolutely no difference in progression-free survival between uh, the intervention arm or the control arm. But patients in the intervention arm had less grade 3-4 toxicity. Um, so this is quite important. And again, demonstrate that maybe we can reduce those at start without hampering survival, but with decreased uh, toxicity risk. And finally, at SIOC 2023, we also had the presentation of the HEPOC study. Um, this is a surgical study, so very interesting. Patients aged 65 years or more that were scheduled for curative intended colorectal resection and that were frail on um, screening tool G8 um, were randomized between an intervention group where they received a comprehensive geriatric assessment be with interventions before the intervention, as well as an exercise program after the intervention. And on the other side, the control group where they had received usual care. And what they saw um, as first results was that patients in the intervention arm had less physical decline. So this really may be related to the exercise program, but nevertheless, I really think it's important to um, have more optimized care for patients receiving surgery as well. So this brings me to the ESCO guidelines on geriatric oncology, um, where we really need to start to implement the, the use of a comprehensive geriatric assessment in older patients with cancer. And so they were um, updated uh, last year by William Dale. And you see that there really are five guidelines for older patients receiving systemic cancer treatment. The first guideline is that we need to do a comprehensive geriatric assessment in order to have some predictive information to guide interventions and to reduce toxicity. And the ASCO guidelines really state that we should do this for all patients 65 years or older starting um, a, a systemic treatment, not only chemotherapy. The second uh, guideline is that we need to include essential geriatric assessment domains in this assessment. So we need to assess function, physical performance, emotional health, comorbid conditions, look at social support, look at poly polypharmacy, assess cognition and nutrition. So these are really essential domains that need to be assessed in this comprehensive geriatric assessment. Then thirdly, we need to implement geriatric assessment guided and targeted interventions. So this is really the new standard of care. We cannot stop at only the assessment. We need to go a step further and do the interventions in order to, to optimize care. We also need to look at life expectancy prognosis by using, for example, one of the validated tools that are listed at ePrognosis website. And finally, the ESCO guidelines um, really come with a practical geriatric assessment, which would be one option uh, to assess these patients. And this is uh, the practical geriatric assessment, or at least the domains that it covers. You can see it has a screening tool. It will um, assess the risk for chemotherapy toxicity by using the CARC tool, and then the different domains that were um, required in uh, the ASCO guidelines for geriatric assessment. And you can find this uh, tool, um, this practical geriatric assessment on the ESCO uh, website. And here you can see it's very easy to fill in. It can be filled in by the patient or the caregiver. 
um, in the waiting room, for example, and when the patient comes to see you, you have this nice overview of how this patient really is, of how the health status of this patient really is. And of course, if we have the results of this uh, practical geriatric assessment, we also need an action chart for it. So for example, if the physical function shows you on question one that there are some falls, um, repetitive falls, maybe we should look at the orthostatic blood pressure of this patient, adjust the medication accordingly. We can uh, see if the cancer treatment is right for a patient that falls frequently. We could prescribe some physiotherapist or uh, occupational therapy in order to resolve this uh, thing. And so, for example, for the different um, problems that you detect in um, this questionnaire, this practical geriatric assessment, you can see that there are different proposed interventions um, which can help you to optimize care. So let's switch to the studies that are looking at priorities of older adults with cancer. Because of course, in many um, registration trials, the primary endpoint is usually survival. And we could ask ourselves if this is really what older patients want. So we already had some data from a trial from Enrico Soto de Perez de Celis um, that was presented at ASCO and SIOC in 2019 where you can see that, of course, uh, older patients also want to live as long as possible, but some patients have other priorities, such as maintaining independence, reducing symptoms, rather than living as long as possible. And patients that are already dependent in their activities of daily living, or patients that have poor social uh, support, were more likely to favor other outcomes than survival. And this was confirmed in two other studies that were recently presented at our annual SIOC meeting. Um, the first study was um, by McEogan Colm, um, and you see here, um, he um, asked patients with open questions what their priorities were, and most patients prioritized time with their family as well as health-related quality of life. And only 2.2% of patients prioritized overall length of life. So this is really confronting that only a minority of patients really prioritize survival. And maybe we should look at different endpoints for older patients with cancer. And this was also confirmed by Sethom um, at a, in a study uh, presented at SIOC. Um, here, 73% of patients pri prioritized quality of life over time um, and 62% uh, prioritized independency, so daily functioning. So these patients do, want, do not want to go to um, have home care or to become independent. No, they want to be independent as long as possible. So we can prolong their life, but it has to be with um, high quality. And interestingly, in this study, in one third of patients, um, st uh, the treatment deviated from standard of care because of the priorities of these patients. So for this, I think it's really important to discuss priorities with our patients before uh, going to a treatment plan. And then I would like to end with some take home messages. I think, and this is really uh, a device from um, a former president of uh, SIOC, all oncologists our medical oncologists, and we need to know how to improve the care of our older patients with cancer. And comprehensive geriatric assessment with interventions can help us in the treatment of older patients with cancer to detect unknown problems, to guide treatment plans, to give us an idea of the life expectancy, to give us predictive information on chemotherapy, toxicity, and functional outcome to improve communication on patient priorities, because this is really important. These patients do not necessarily want to live as long as possible at all costs. No, they want quality of life. They want to be independent, to decrease the risk of chemotherapy toxicity and to improve their quality of life. So I really think 
it's time to implement a comprehensive geriatric assessment in our daily practice in order to improve care for older adults with cancer. So you should discuss this with your geriatric team to see how you can implement this. And if this is not possible because of the workload, because of a shortage of uh, geriatricians or a ger uh, workload at the geriatric team, please use a practical geriatric assessment in order to at least give you an idea of how these patients are. This is really interesting to read the ESCO guidelines published by William Dale in the JCO. So I would like to end today um, by thinking if you really want to improve care of your older patients, maybe you should join uh, SIOC. We have our un annual meeting next year in October in beautiful Montreal. So if you really want to learn how to optimize care of your older patients with cancer, please join the SIOC family and come to Montreal in October 2024. Thank you very much.